In the 16th and 17th centuries, developments in Europe played an important role in changing the world. These developments caused by European states were developments that occurred on a global scale. This situation led to the domination of European states in many parts of Asia and Africa and led to a new organization of production, namely industrial capitalism. European travelers were especially amazed by the great power of the Asian empires. However, the power of the Asian empires began to decline as European states began to dominate world politics. After the Thirty Years' War, the European colonies in Asia had become trading posts for the European states. In the 16th century, the Portuguese conquered Goa, an enclave on the southwest coast of India, and built an impressive city by European standards at the time, they established a trading city on the island of Macau off the coast of southern China. But their efforts seemed insignificant compared to the great kingdoms and empires nearby. The first Portuguese visitors to the capital of one of the four kingdoms in South India, Vijayanagar, noted that it was as large as Rome and the best equipped city in the world. In 1525, the Mongol emperors who invaded the north of India began to build magnificent cities such as Lahore, Delhi and Agra. The rulers of the Chinese empire did not yet see the Europeans on the southern coast as a threat. For them, the threat came from the nomadic peoples of the north. Meanwhile, the Ottomans became a threat to Western Europe. After conquering Constantinople in 1453, they took Cairo in 1517, Algeria in 1528, Hungary in 1526, and laid siege to Vienna in 1529, and again in 1683. The Ottoman Empire was a constant actor in the diplomatic games and military coalitions of Reformation Europe, and its culture was much admired in the literature of the time. In addition to the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire in India, the Safavid Empire in Persia was also of interest to Europeans. The Japanese islands had borrowed much from Chinese culture and technique, and through the wars fought for dominance over each other by aristocratic lords using steel and gunpowder, they had established relatively advanced civilizations that shared some of the characteristics of European feudalism. Even in Europe, a great power had emerged outside the area swept away by the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the wars of religion. In the East, successive rulers had begun to transform the former Duchy of Moscow into a centralized Russian state, and later into an empire that spread throughout northern Asia and usurped Poland in the West. These empires began to experience an economic decline in the late 19th century. Let us start with China, one of the most important Asian empires. In the first half of the 15th century, China was beginning to emerge from the depression of the 14th century. This is evidenced by a series of naval expeditions. Fleets of large ships carrying more than 20,000 people sailed 6,000 miles non-stop to the west coast of India, Aden, and East Africa. By the 16th century, China had begun to use new machinery in agriculture, adopting new methods of cultivating the land, irrigating, sowing seeds and improving the soil and selecting new crops. New methods were tried in industry. In the first half of the 17th century, scientific or technical publications were published on problems in such diverse fields as agricultural techniques, ceramics, weaving, iron and steel, river transport, weapons, ink, paper and hydraulic devices. These changes were not limited to the technological field. Important changes were also taking place in China's intellectual life. Many thinkers who opposed traditional morals and ideas also emerged. The Chinese state converted the former labor obligation of peasants and artisans into cash taxes. The commercialization of agriculture led to the production of industrial inputs such as cotton, dyes, plant oils and tobacco. Poorer peasants, driven off their land by landowners, sought other means of subsistence. Trade and craft enterprises grew rapidly, especially in the coastal areas of the East and South. As in Europe, most production was still carried out in artisan workshops. Some of the small businesses grew into large enterprises employing several hundred workers. Chinese industry has started to produce not only for China but also for other parts of the world. The poorer classes in China were also growing, but despite this, the Chinese empire was in a glorious period. But this growth and splendor would not last long. For much of the 17th century, the Chinese empire fell into a devastating depression similar to that of Europe. Epidemics, floods, droughts and other disasters followed one after another. Famine devastated entire regions. Population growth stopped. In fact, the basis of this crisis lay in the organization of Chinese society. The state and its bureaucratic class had encouraged economic expansion after the crisis of the 14th century. But they soon began to fear certain side effects, especially the growing influence of the merchants. In 1433, the sea voyages to India and Africa were abruptly halted. The Ming Empire's greatest concern was not to allow coastal trade, lest it undermine the social life of their agrarian society. The rulers could not stop all overseas trade. What today would be called the black market increased in coastal areas and there were fierce armed conflicts with the pirates who controlled such areas.
However, state measures prevented the development of new forms of production. Meanwhile, the ever-increasing unproductive expenditure of the state was an enormous burden on the economy. A war with Japan for control of Korea emptied the treasury completely. Severe hardship led to social discontent. Almost every year between 1596 and 1626 saw uprisings of urban laborers in the most economically developed parts of the country. In 1603 miners from private mines marched on Beijing, the 1,620s saw uprisings of non-Chinese peoples in the southwest, and in the 1,630s there was a major peasant uprising in the north of the country. At the top of society, a kind of dissent even emerged among intellectuals and former mandarins, but it was suppressed by the secret police network. Political collapse followed in 1644. The last Ming emperor drowned himself, and the former shepherd leader of a peasant army founded a new dynasty. A month later, Manchu invaders from the north captured Beijing. The economic and political crisis was very similar to the crises in Europe at the same time. But there was one difference. The merchant and artisan classes were unable to put forward their own alternative to the old order. In Chinese society, as in previous major crises, the merchant and artisan classes were too dependent on the state bureaucracy to provide an alternative. The initial chaos lasted only a few years. The Manchus had long ago adopted many aspects of Chinese civilization, by restoring internal peace and stabilizing the imperial finances, they offered, if only for a time, a framework for economic recovery. Trade and craft production once again reached a scale that surpassed previous levels. The absolute power of the empire led to a complacency in ruling circles, which in turn led to intellectual stagnation. The early years of Manchu rule witnessed a flourishing of intellectual inquiry, a questioning of the intellectual foundations and institutions of the authoritarian empire, and free thought and radical criticism. Art, literature, philosophy and history seem to have been affected by a spirit of revival. However, this critical spirit slowed down as the educated classes supported the new regime. There was a decline in the popular literature of the urban middle classes, and most criticism of the regime even what could be interpreted as moderate criticism was banned. In 1795 a new wave of uprisings began with the White Lotus Uprising, and one of the largest uprisings in China's history followed within half a century. Now let us consider the Mughal Indian Empire. Mughal India was a very different society from China. It did not have large canal and irrigation systems, a centralized bureaucracy trained in a literary tradition almost 2,000 years old, a class of large landowners, or a peasantry that bought and sold in local markets. Successive Islamic rulers had conquered much of northern India from the 13th century onwards, imposing centralized structures on the peasant economy of the Indian Middle Ages. The Mughal emperors developed this system and ruled the country with a hierarchy of officials who were granted the right to collect land taxes in certain regions and with this they supplied the cavalry necessary for the military functions of the state. They were not landowners, although they became rich from the exploitation of the peasantry. In each region there was also another class of landowners, the Zamindars. These were pre-Mongol exploiting classes, mostly belonging to the upper Hindu castes, who helped collect taxes and received a share of the profits. The medieval caste system remained intact and peasants who did not pay their taxes became slaves. The bulk of the surplus product thus received from the peasants went to the imperial court, the state bureaucracy, and the armies. The state not only functioned as the protective arm of the exploiting class, but was itself the main instrument of exploitation. Very little of these revenues went back to the villages. The state utilized them in the cities and towns of the empire. The result was an increase in trade and urban craft production and the development of an economically far from static system. The Mongol period witnessed an unprecedented industrial and commercial prosperity, reflected in general urban development. There was a concentration, expansion and increase of crafts and an increase in both domestic and international trade. The Mughal Indian Empire was especially using cotton as an export material and sending it to Europe and ensuring the development of trade. Indian cities were developing tremendously thanks to trade. However, one element was missing to make this economic development permanent, the industrial development in the cities had no feedback in the villages. The products produced by the peasants were forcibly confiscated and the peasants were not even left with enough to feed themselves. The villages could not adapt to the industrial developments in the cities and therefore the development of crafts in the cities stagnated and the villages became poorer. The long-term effect of this was the destruction of the peasant-based production base of the empire. While the empire built magnificent monuments with tax revenues, the peasants were plundered and forced to abandon their lands. Cities grew partly because landless laborers flocked to them in search of work. But this could not ameliorate the debilitating effects of overtaxation of the countryside. Just when the empire seemed at its most glorious, it entered a decline that was to become permanent. After 1712, urban industry began to suffer from agricultural decline. Discontent at this time found expression in the emergence of new religious sects.
these used spoken dialects instead of the dead language Sanskrit, and their prophets and preachers came mainly from the lower classes. These sects challenged the traditional Brahmin-based religious ideology and favored uncompromising monotheism, the abandonment of ritual forms of worship, the rejection of caste barriers and communal distinctions. But they also shied away from the language of unconditional rebellion. This began to change as the situation of the followers of these sects deteriorated. They inspired the two most powerful uprisings against the Mongols. In 1709 there was a major Sikh uprising and the uprising of the Marathas, the only force that played a major role in the downfall of the empire. The fighting power of the uprisings was provided by the anger of the peasants. Their leaders, however, usually came from the zamindars or local exploiting classes who complained that a large share of the surplus produce went to the ruling Mughal class. The uprising of the oppressed was mixed with a war between two oppressing classes. Merchants and artisans did not play a central role in the uprisings. They relied on the luxury markets of the Mongol rulers and, in certain parts of Europe, lacked the local market network that allowed the urban classes to influence the peasantry. The old society was in crisis, but the bourgeoisie was not ready to play an independent role in the struggle to transform it. This left the Zamindar leaders free to exploit the uprising for their own ends, which could not move society forward.